Well, thank you for joining us for this breakout session number four. I'm Bonnie McEwen with the Northwest District Office in Sioux City. And this presentation is all about STEAM programming. And providing STEAM programming can be so beneficial for the youth in your communities. So you're going to hear about how Cedar Falls Public Library went from zero to full steam ahead. Get it? <laughs> Pretty clever description there over the course of two years. And Katie assures us that you don't have to be a steam expert to incorporate these ideas. So here to tell us all about it is Katie Nedwick. She has her master's degree in library science, and she has worked in libraries for 17 years. Her experience spans two states. She has been in academic, school, and public libraries, and she currently works in the youth department at the Cedar Falls Public Library. So Katie is here to tell us all about her STEAM programming. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thank you, Bonnie, so much. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for this program. Um, and uh, yeah, like I like Bonnie said, we're going to talk about STEAM stuff. So uh, here's our game plan for today. Uh, I'm going to give you a little introduction to myself uh, and how I got into STEAM, just because I always like to hear the story of people and how they got where they are. So I thought I would share that with you as well. I am very briefly going to touch on what is STEAM, just in case if we have some people brand new and they're not quite sure um, about that. So I'm just going to kind of go over that really quickly. And then the bulk of my presentation is going to be going over doubts. So I'm going to bust some doubts you might have into your STEAM, um, if you have any doubts about going into STEAM programming. And then I'm also going to give you some program ideas that I have done. And I'm also going to share some resources with you to do some STEAM programming. So even if you have been in STEAM programming for a while, so you don't really have any doubts. I'm hoping that programs and resources that I talk about today, there might be some new ones to you there, and you can be re-inspired to try something new in your programming. And we're going to follow that loop a few times through. So we'll do doubts, programs, resources, doubts, programs, resources. And then I am going to end with um, five minutes at the end for questions. And also I'll have my contact information. So if you want to get a hold of me, follow me on social media, all that stuff will be listed on my last slide. And then I just ask if you would save your questions till the end, uh, just because like uh, Bonnie was saying, I might answer it during my presentation. So, all right. So, hey, I'm Katie. There's me in my awesome science gear. Um, I prefer she, her, hers pronouns. And um, I, like Bonnie said, I've been in libraries for a really long time, since 2004. And um, I've kind of done a little bit of a lot of things in libraries. I can't say everything. I've never done cataloging and don't want to. Um, no offense to catalogers out there, but I've been in academic public libraries. I've worked in circulation. I've worked in, um, now I'm in the youth department. So I've kind of done a little bit of everything. And um, I'm currently at the Cedar Falls Public Library. And when I moved from our circulation department to our youth department, there wasn't a dedicated um, STEM programming going on really uh, at that time. And I was kind of thinking, you know, it'd be nice if we had some of that here, but I'm not the one to do that. No, I'm not really into STEM programming. I don't really care about technology that much. I mean, you know, I do social media and I can check my email or whatever, but I don't know a lot about like computers and computer programming. I hate math. So, you know, I'm just not the one who's going to take over on that. And then in August of 2019, the State Library of Iowa had a STEM fair. Uh, it was an all-day event, and I thought maybe I would check it out because I kept thinking about STEM programming. It was on my mind, and so I thought, well, I'll just check it out and see what that's all about, and um, it was a really great time, and I left having some program ideas, some resources, and most importantly, I left having a confidence that I actually could do STEM programming at my library. And I'm hoping to impart the same to you guys today. So hopefully you'll leave here if you don't have confidence with the confidence that you can actually do this with also some new program ideas and some new resources. 
So very quickly, if you are brand new and you've never heard of um, STEM before or STEAM, this is what it stands for. So the S is for science, T is technology, E is engineering, A is arts, and M is for math. You might also see this as STEM, which is without the A, and I might go back and forth and call it STEAM or STEM. Basically, it's the same kind of thing. It's just they have the A out of it. Um, some other variations that I have seen before is uh, STREAM, which they add an R into it. So that stands for research, which makes sense because you have to do a lot of research in a lot of these areas. Um, and then also I have seen the A standing for architecture. So those are some other variations that you might see, but they're all kind of referring to the same thing, which is um, the meat of it, which is like science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. All right, so first doubt that I've got to bust today. What if I don't know the answer to something a kid asks me or a parent asks you too, because that might happen. And the tip that I want to give to you guys today is that you don't have to know all the answers. Um, and, uh, you know, at the STEM fair that I went to, uh, that was one thing that was really helpful to me. There was someone who presented who had a STEM club, and she said that sometimes kids ask her a question and she doesn't know the answer to it. And her response just is, I don't know. Why don't we do some research into that? And I think this is really helpful. Um, and actually, kind of even better for the kiddos if you don't know the answer for two reasons. First of all, you demonstrate that not everyone is going to know all the answers and it's okay for them not to know all the answers. Um, so it, you don't have to know all the answers in whatever field you go to. And also in the real world, people don't know all the answers. You know, when they built the first cell phone, they didn't have an answer about, you know, how to do that. So it's okay if they don't know. And then also it gives the opportunity for them to do some research and to practice that. And that is a big skill that they will need as well. Or if they like stumble and they have a problem that they need to work out, they can practice their problem solving skills. So it's actually good if you don't know the answer and then they have have to work on finding the answer. Um, one program that I was worried a little bit about that is um, uh, my worm farmer for a day program, which I'm going to get into a little bit. But first, I want to talk to you guys about my worm farm. So that picture there on your right is a worm farm that we have in the library. It actually has live worms in it that compost. And um, there's a link there in the slides for the composting bin, that specific one that I have there. It actually has four trays. So this just is one tray on it, but there's three other trays that um, can stack on top of it so you can actually grow your worms. Right now, I only have one tray going and I just keep the empty ones on top of it. Um, so as you can tell, it doesn't take up a lot of space and actually being a worm farmer isn't a huge time commitment. You just have to feed your worms like food scraps a few times a week, make sure their moisture is good and that sort of thing, but it doesn't take a huge time commitment. So um, if you're interested in pursuing having a worm farm at your library, um, you know, it's not a huge time commitment. You do have to learn a little bit about the worms though. Um, so, you know, that's one thing, but, um, I started this worm farmer for a day program and one of the kiddos asked me if worms have eyes and actually kids ask a lot of questions and parents about worm farming that I just have to say, well, I don't really know. I'm still kind of learning. Um, uh, but just so you guys know, worms don't have eyes. They have receptors that sense light and darkness. So that's your worm trivia for the day. I bet you didn't think you were going to learn that at a library conference, but <laughs> maybe it'll be helpful helpful at some trivia if you ever do that. Um, but anyway, uh, this is what the worm farm looks like without the lid on the picture on the left there. And then, of course, if we're talking about the worms, you have to see the worms. So there's a picture of some of the worms there on the right. And uh, basically, the Worm Farmer for a Day program came out of needing an in-person program because our virtual program attendance had really dropped. This was um, like last summer. We were still not doing in-person programming, uh, and we were trying to do virtual, and just the numbers were not there. So we wanted to do something in-person, but we weren't really ready to go full-on regular big groups in person yet. And so I thought, well, I have this worm farm here. So 
what if I had kiddos come and they could feed the worm farm? And it would just be the kids with their family unit. So it wouldn't be any outsiders. It would just be like one-on-one, -on -one, me and then the families. And um, so that's what we've been doing. Uh, so what I do is I have, I'll do, I'll set up a month at a time. I'll set aside a month and say, you can sign up to be a worm farmer for a day. And then I set, I have like two per week. So I'll leave a couple days in between so the worms have time to eat the food. And what the kids do is they can come in. I teach them about the worm farm and the worms. And uh, they can uh, feed the worms if they want to. And they can bring in their own food. And I'll give them guidelines on what they can bring. Or I'll provide food for them because I don't want not having food scraps to be a barrier for people. And then um, they also um, help me measure the environment. And so we look at three different things. We look at the moisture of uh, the worm farm. We look at the pH reading and then also the temperature. And so I have my uh, meters there that we use um, and I give them to the kids. They do the measurement themselves. I have a spreadsheet so they record the data down. So they're getting practice doing that as well. And then these are a couple other tools that we use. Uh, there's a hand rake there, which they use to dig in the dirt to find where the worms are at. The kids love that. And then um, after they measure the environment and after they feed the worms, if they want to hold a worm, I will let them do that. Some kiddos are like all in on that. They really want to hold a worm and that's totally cool. Some kids no, thank you. They don't want anything to do with that. And then some kids are kind of on the fence. And so if I offer them a glove, a guardian glove for them to wear, they will hold the word, but they just want that little barrier. So um, I also have gloves available there. And um, I have everything linked here. You guys should be able to get the slides off of the website. Um, so I just wanted to mention that I have a ton of links in my slides. So um, make sure you get those if you're interested in any of this programming. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of what we do for that program. And if you guys are interested in doing it at your library, um, you can also be a slightly weird librarian that has worms in their library. Uh, you can get them from, these are two popular word for, worm farmers. The Squirm Firm is where I got mine from. And then there's also Uncle Jim's Worm Farm. These are also great resources just for information on worm farming. And if you have questions about something that's going on, you can reach out to those guys. They sell live worms as well. So if you don't want to buy a full on worm farm like the one I have, there are tons of instructions online on how to make your own worm bin. Uh, there's a link here on the right uh, for instructions on how to make a worm bin. It's just out of a plastic storage tote. So it's super easy. And then you could just buy worms from one of the worm farmers. Um, you might ask, can I just dig up worms in my yard? And what I have learned, but did not know, is that your worms in your yard are not communal liver, live, they don't communally live together like the composting worms, they're red wiggler worms is what we use for composting. And they do like to live together. So they're really great for composting and being in a small enclosed space together. The worms you find in your yard don't like to do that. They like to dig and they like to be apart from each other. And so they don't make good composting worms. So I recommend uh, getting them from the worm farmers for sure. Uh, these programs have been really, have really good um, interest. I did it in the fall for one month. I was going to do it for four weeks. And then I had so many people interested. I had to add a, another week. So we actually did it for five weeks. Um, and so it's kind of surprising. And also it's a variety of ages that are interested. I had one family that had a like a three or four year old up to a teenager and then also the mom was there as well and all the kids were engaged I mean the toddler kind of came and went but she would keep coming back and the parent was engaged the teenager was engaged like everybody was really interested so it's a really good program that you can go like all ages with um, so yeah, it's been kind of surprising. I called it my little program that could, because I had no idea that there would be any interest in this, but yeah, there, there is. So, um, I got my worm farm from the scale up award. Uh, so I want to share this resource with you. If you're not familiar with it, it's put um, together by the Iowa governor's STEM advisory council. And basically what it is, is you can apply for this award and then you get um, STEM materials uh, to use in your library. 
And it is currently open right now until February 28th. So you can apply for it currently. And uh, every year what they offer changes up. So these ones that I have listed here are good to do in libraries. The award is available for also classroom teachers. And so some of the programs that are available wouldn't really work great in a library setting, but they're great for like a classroom. But these ones listed here are the ones that are really good for a library setting. And I would bring your attention to the third one from the bottom there called Storytime STEM Hacks. That one is amazing. And I'm going to talk about it a little later in the presentation. So I would definitely check that out. Oh, and then the link there is the link to the website. Uh, so you guys can check that out. Two years ago, when I got my worm, or yeah, I got my worm farm two years ago when I won the award. Um, and that was with the um, Pint Size Science is what I won that year, which was put together by the Science Center of Iowa. And these were also what I got with that. So I got four kits with different themes and it just came with all this um, materials that you can use to plan a lot science programs in your library. Uh, so I just wanted to show you that's one of the options. And then later I will show that I had gotten before. Unfortunately, they're not an option this year, but and then later I'll tell you about the story time stem packs, which I got last year. Okay, another doubt I'm gonna bust for you. I just can't do steam, steam stuff. Um, and what I wanna tell you, the little tip is that you are already doing STEM stuff in your library, even if you aren't marketing it as that, or you don't think that you're doing it. Um, if anybody in libraries ever had a art or craft program, you know, that's your arts that you're already doing. If you've ever done a counting story time, that's math. And so you're already doing that. If you have Lego programs or you have Legos or blocks in your play area, that's engineering. Um, so all this stuff you're already doing in your library. And the program idea I want to share with you guys is STEM story time. This is not really a new concept and maybe you guys have been doing this. Uh, what I really wanted to point out to you is this article I have linked here called The Roots of STEM Success. That was, it's by the Bay Area Discovery Museum. This was brought to my attention by Joe Lee from the Science Center of Iowa when I was doing my training for the Pint Science Science Award with her. She brought this article and had us all read it. And what it really talks about is how our youngest patrons, babies, toddlers, uh, preschoolers, the way that they learn and um, explore the world around them, the thinking they use for that is very similar to a lot of the stuff that we are doing in STEM programming. And um, so, th but the thing is, those kiddos don't get a lot of opportunities to do STEAM or STEM um, thinking or projects or play because kids don't get that until they get into school usually. And even when they're in school, they don't get it until later ages. Um, especially you're talking like, you know, in elementary school, I'm sure they're getting that too, but it's a lot of focus later on um, getting ready for careers, right? And that's like the big push for these programs is getting ready for career fields and that sort of thing. And so our littles who already are kind of exploring the world and things like that, they aren't getting this kind of education. And I think that's where libraries can fill that gap. And especially with their Steve story time, because a lot of our story times are for our younger patrons. Um, so I just wanted to quickly mention also, there's a link here for educator resources. I just happened to find that page as I was searching for this article, so I haven't really gotten to dig into it, but it looks very promising, and there's a resource on there that is a guide for library staff, so I just wanted to share that with you guys so you could take a look at that, and I'm going to look into it too. I think they might have some really good stuff that we could use to develop some programming in our libraries too. Um, so for my STEAM story time, um, how it differs from my regular story time is that I always try to include a simple nonfiction book. That can be um, an actual like nonfiction, like right now I'm using easy reader sometimes because I'm having really we're having small in-person story times. Back when we were only doing virtual story times, I could get away with an easy reader um, when I'm back to normal, I have bigger story types. Easy readers probably won't work because the pictures aren't very big. But right now I can get away with that, which is really nice. Uh, but also uh, we have some books that we are that are shelved in our picture book collection that have some nonfiction 
aspects to them, but might not be what we would actually put in like our nonfiction collection. We've been getting a lot of those in lately. Um, my supervisor's ordering a lot of those kind of books. And so those I really love um, for my story times. So um, I always try to add one of those to my story times. And then for my steam story times, you, well, for my regular story times, after we're done, we have a craft. One craft, everyone does together. They go to the tables, you know, and they can work on it. When I was doing student story time before the pandemic, I wanted to do, I did activity centers. So I would have four centers set up and everybody could rotate through the centers and each one would have a different STEM or STEAM activity that they could work on. And it could be art related, which is kind of similar to what we did originally, but didn't have to be. Um, right now, uh, we are doing small in-person story times, like I said, and but we're not doing any activities afterwards. And so I'm giving them a take-home activity that relates to our STEM concept. So I have done um, engineering story time and I've given them marshmallows and toothpicks so they can practice building. I did a shape story time for one of our math ones and I gave them paper tangrams, which are shapes that they can put together to make other things. So they can make like a house or like animals and that sort of thing. So I gave them those and they could take home and they could play with those. Um, back when we were fully virtual uh, story times, no in-person, what I did is I made a Pinterest board for on our library Pinterest page. And I would make a board for each STEM topic that I did. And I would just announce to the parents, I have this board with STEM activities. So if you want to go there, you can find fun activities that you can do at home. And I'm still doing that now. And I let parents know since I can't do all my stations, I just give them that one activity to take home. I just let them know if they want to do some more activities related to this topic, go to our Pinterest and we have those boards there. Um, so for the topics I have covered, I have done um, water animals, bats, dinosaurs, the body. Under technology, I've done robots and patterns. Pa patterns could also go in math, but that's a something that they need for computer coding is, is patterns. And so technology is really hard for me to plan for for a little. So I give myself a win and I put that in the technology column. Uh, engineering, I've done building. And then for math, I've done numbers, measurements, and shapes. And these are some pictures I wanted to just show you the activities I did when I did activity centers. This is for my number story time. So I made a activity walk where they would do an activity and it would, each time they would go up the number of times they would do and it would be a different activity. So the first one would be clap your hands one time. So when they stand on it, they clap their hands once. Then the second one is blink your eyes twice. So they go there and blink your eyes. Then it might be turn around three times in a circle. And so they would do that. Um, and then it goes up to number 10. So they walk the whole circle and then they count up to 10 while they're doing all these fun activities. Uh, the next one I had was a matching game. This is something I found on Pinterest. Basically, they count the numbers of dots in the circles and then just match the little paper cup on top of the one, the correct one. And I had four of these set out on the carpet so multiple kids could do this at a time. And then I had counting bears where, um, you know, there, I'm sure you guys have maybe have counting things uh, like this at your place, but I put a little sheet on the table that had questions so the grownups kind of knew what to ask the kiddos. So we would ask how many total bears are there? How many different colors are there? Um, how many red ones are? That sort of thing. So they could do that. And then my last activity, this is based on the fact that we would do a craft that they would get to take home and I was worried that they would want that. So I had them, um, I printed out a sheet with black numbers and they could just put little stickers in it to match the numbers. And that way if they wanted to take something home, they could. And this was stickers that we just have had in the department forever. We weren't using it for anything. So I just used them for this. Um, for resources, you want to check Pinterest uh, for sure for activities, especially. I just search for whatever topic I'm doing and then I add STEAM or STEM and then, you know, the grade level. So water, STEAM, pre K. Um, I have our Cedar Falls Public Library listed there, the Pinterest page. So if you want to look at some of the activities I had list that I put 
on our boards, you could check that. And then the bottom through there are websites I found through Pinterest that have really good activities. So those are also good resources to check. I also use the internet um, and I just use this to find full on story times usually. It's really good if I can't think of a topic and I can go browse what other libraries did. I'm like, oh, that sounds like a great topic to do a story time on. Or if I have a topic in mind, but I can't quite find enough good books or songs to go with it, then I will do this. Uh, the top three there are ones that I have used in the past that I really like. The bottom one is another resource that I just found when I was getting ready for this presentation that looks really good, but I haven't really dug into it a lot, but I wanted to share it with you guys because I think it will be a good one. So you guys can dig into that one and see what you think. And then lastly, obviously, don't forget about your books. Um, as you do with your normal story time, you might be reading a new book that came in and all of a sudden you think, oh, that would be really good for this type of the story time. Same thing applies for your STEM story times. And additionally, don't forget to look at your STEM collections. Um, you know, like your actual nonfiction science books, you probably have some over there that have experiments and things like that. And you might be able to develop a program around that. We recently got a new one in that was called Fairy Tales and STEM or Fairy Tales and Science, something like that. Basically, the book is it has a fairy tale, the whole story, and then it has a uh, STEM activity related to the story. And I am really excited to dig into that and plan some programming around that book. So make sure you look at your books too. Um, okay, so another doubt I want to bust for you guys is it's too hard. Um, and I want to tell you guys, you're in a library youth department or maybe a team department, but um, it can be very, very simple. It doesn't, it could be hard, but most likely it's probably not going to be. And this is two different ways. So first of all, your content can be really simple. Okay, we're not teaching calculus to preschoolers. Um, they're not going to plan a whole computer program at, you know, at that age, probably. <laughs> Maybe you'll have some geniuses. But for the most part, we're doing really easy stuff. And I like to think about going back to kind of like the basic building blocks of these areas. And that's pretty much what we're focusing on in the youth department. And so you don't have to worry if you don't know how to computer code, you know, you can just do patterns and maybe sequencing. And that is the precursors to coding. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing about it being very simple is the actual program itself does not have to be complicated. So the example I want to give you for this is if you want to do a program about an engineering program, let's say, and you want to build a bridge, you yourself do not have to have all the steps worked out. And, you know, they're going to do step one, two, three, four. And then at the end, they're going to have this beautiful bridge that looks exactly like this. And it's going to hold all the cars and it's going to be a functioning, perfect bridge. That doesn't have to be what your program can be. It literally can be, hey, kids, so happy you're here today. We're going to try to build a bridge. Here's some recycled building materials. Go at it and have fun. It, I mean, you don't have to have it be very complicated. And actually, it's better if you don't have all those steps in place and you don't have an end outcome that has to look exactly like this. Um, just like you probably maybe you've been hearing with like arts and crafts for story times, it's really good for them to have some creativity and um, to be able to develop that on their own and be able to do that, have the freedom to be creative and do what they want to do. Also, in STEM areas, creative problem solving is pretty crucial in all of these areas. And so not giving them all the steps and allowing them when they run into a problem to try and figure out how to solve that on their own is actually really good for these areas. So, um, you know, I say do a free forum. It's a lot better. It's a lot easier for you and it's a lot better for the kiddos. So a program that I had um, that I did this with is uh, fairy tale engineering. And we did three uh, or two different programs. I did the three little pigs and uh, the three Billy Goats Gruff. Also, side note, have you guys ever noticed there's a lot of threes in fairy tales? I don't know what the deal is with that. But anyway, <laughs> um, 
And basically it was kind of free form. Uh, my supervisor mentioned throughout, you know, fairy tale engineering. I didn't really know a lot about it. And to be honest, didn't really do a ton of research into it. I just figured what I would do is uh, here, we're going to read this fairy tale and then you're going to build. Um, so, or a similar fairy tale for three uh, little pigs. I read the true story of the three little pigs from the wolf's point of view because that's my favorite. And then for three Billy Goats Gruff, I read like I think the actual story with Paul Galdon. I think I did his book of it. But basically, I gave them a task. I said, You're going to build a house that can withstand the wolf's huffing and puffing. And then in our custodian room, I found a big uh, floor fan, like one of those circle ones that has like the skinny part that shoots out the air. That was the wolf. And if they wanted to, they could use, they could test their house they built against the wolf. And then for three Billy Goats Gruff, their task was to build a bridge that could hold a troll or a goat. And I used a puppet for that because we have a ton of puppets and we have both a troll and a goat puppet. And so they had a choice if they wanted to test out their bridge, they could put the troll or the goat puppet on it and see if it would hold up to them. Um, I just want to make a note that I testing their creations is just optional. None of the kiddos have to do that. I am not here to make a kiddo cry because they spent an hour working on this beautiful house and then I turned a fan on it and it broke down. The important part of this program is the building and the brainstorming and the problem solving. That's the most important part. I'm not going to do the destructive. If they want to, they can. And actually most kiddos want to test their stuff, which is very surprising to me, but they do want to test it. So, um, but yeah, I would leave that optional if I was up to you know, for you guys. And then um, also just a side note, in case if you're still doing virtual programming, I think I have not done this virtually, but if I were to do it virtually, probably what I would do is I would give them each a uh, set of building materials, the same set. So each kiddo gets three paper towel rolls. Each kiddo gets two pieces of construction paper. And I would send them home, let them build probably. And then I would come together on Zoom on a certain day and time and everyone could share what they built. That is probably how I would handle this. The only thing that would be an issue possibly is there might be a barrier if, you know, kiddos don't have scissors or glue or tape at home. So that might be something you would have to navigate and provide. But that's how I would turn this virtually. Now, um, I just wanted to share with you guys my engineering design process. This is how I would. This is how I structure my program. So I explained to them that this is how engineers do their work. And so we would read the fairy tale, and then I tell them, okay, so what we're the problem we're trying to solve is this. I will tell them what that is, and then I give them time to do two and three to brainstorm and design. We kind of smush that together. Basically, they can look at what materials I have for them, and they can. Um, I give them a piece of paper and I have them write or sketch what they think that they want to do. Then I give them a lot of time to free build and they can build whatever they want. And then finally, if they want to do step five and test it, they can, and then they can work on improvements if they want to. And uh, just a note on um, the building materials, this is pretty low cost if you're interested in doing something like this. I just asked my coworkers to save me their recycled stuff. So we, I don't take glass for safety reasons, but um, cereal boxes and that kind of cardboard, um, uh, plastic materials that they have, you know, like with their fruit containers or yogurt containers, that sort of thing. Cardboard, um, like paper towel rolls, I get a ton of those. Um, so that kind of thing. And then I just add in stuff from our craft area. So construction paper, ribbon, and then of course tools, glue, tape, scissors. I will say tape is better than glue because you don't have to wait for that to dry. And something that I've learned, um, you might consider some sort of way for them to transport their collection home. So I think I'm going to do another free build program this summer and I'm saving the tops of like paper boxes. Like when you buy reams of paper and you have that nice lid that goes on the top. So I'm saving those and also shallow boxes so they can have like a little tray to like bring their creation home in because sometimes it's kind of hard to carry these. Um, also on the slide, there's a link to the PDF to this document. So if you want to print it out, you are able to do that. I just want to share a few quick pictures here. 
uh, this is one of the bridges that somebody made, uh, you know, not anything that we would see probably in real life, but I love that they have um, uh, the um, foundation there with the putty and then all the design elements are really fun with all the ribbon and the yarn. Uh, these are a couple of the houses that were made for the uh, Three Little Pigs. I really love the welcome mat on the one there on the left. And then on the right, the McDonald's cups that they use for this structure. Um, these kids are just so creative. And then this was one last one for the house, the Three Little Pigs one. Um, I just really love they had a really thick base. And they added the green... Um, part I think they added that after they had tested it and they didn't have a strong enough base it was just the bowl so they added that later um, so going back to our doubt of simplicity I just wanted to mention to you guys story time stunt packs really quick this was the other option that um, I won on the scale up award which you guys can apply for now um, but you can also just purchase these straight from the website. So if you don't want to mess with applying for the award, um, there's a link here to their website. What these are is that they made these with libraries in mind. They heard libraries don't have time to plan, don't have time to learn STEM concepts, but still want to do STEM programming. And they put everything together for you. So you get a book, you get an activity, there's instructions on how to do it. There's the science behind it. They link it to like school curriculum things that I don't understand, but if that's important to you, that's listed in there too. And then they give you the materials to actually do the activity. I think it's up to maybe 20 kids. I'm not sure they have a limit on how many they offer you, but you can actually do it. And this program right here, I did this the past this past fall when astronaut Chari was going to the International Space Station and he is from Cedar Falls. And so I wanted to coordinate, like get the kids excited that we have an actual astronaut that lived here that's going to space. How cool is that? And in my program description, I said I wanted to link to that. So I just said, Raja, astronaut Raja Chari is going to space soon. And then I had my program description description of like what we we're going to do with the program and parents and kiddos read that as the astronaut is actually going to be at this library program he was not at the program the program was a week before he went to space he was you know in quarantine getting ready for his space trip and i found this out at the very beginning of the program i wanted i was freaking out what am I going to do? These kids thought there was going to be an astronaut. I just told them there's not going to be an astronaut. And now I have this program that's going to seem not fun in comparison. This is actually about, the book is about the first spacesuit that was ever made in case if you're interested. And um, what we do is we do some like spacesuit testing with like materials you have around your house. And the kids absolutely loved it. And I think that is a testament to the Storytime STEM packs because it definitely wasn't on me. I didn't design this at all, but I can't speak highly enough about this. The kids loved it, they had a blast and it was very low prep for me. So I highly recommend checking them out. All right, I have one last doubt that I want to bust for you guys, and this was one I was really worried about, which is what if I can't think of any ideas for programming? And my friends, this sounds really stupid, but honestly, it once you're in it, STEM stuff just magically finds you. And that's all I can say about it. It's just kind of crazy. I actually have a document going right now with future programs that I want to do because I'll be researching for one program and I stumble across something else and I'm like, wow, I can make a program around that too. And I'll put that on my doc and I'll do that later. I mean, it's, it's amazing how this stuff just kind of magically comes to you. Um, this happened with my uh, Steam uh, Grab and Go kits, which we did this past May. Uh, in them, we included instructions, materials for an activity. Uh, I'd make a book list with uh, additional books that they could read. And then also we'd have random related materials. It might be a coloring sheet, maybe more informational stuff. Uh, we had leftover glow sticks that were going bad, and I just threw those in a space one that I had put together. So this is also a good way to... Um, get rid of stuff that you have lying around. If you are doing in-person programming, I think a lot of these you could turn into an in-person program too. And uh, what happened with this is it was time for me to plan these kits. I needed four of them for one week for a whole month. And I was at the time I thought, yeah, I can do that. No problem. And then I went to do it and I had no idea where I had no idea what I was going to do. So I just kind of started digging around in the office and I found this box we had gotten from NASA. Um, and it just had stuff 
in it that was perfect for this. Um, I don't know where I got it from. It magically came to me from somebody um, and it just worked out perfect. Um, they have a UV color changing kit and a cloud teller. Those are both listed there. So you guys can take a look at them. The cloud teller, I'm actually turning into an in-person program because I actually had too many grab and go ideas. So I bumped that one. And when I was looking for something on the Steve Spangler website, which they do uh, science kits put together already for kids, they had a cloud in a jar experiment. And I was like, oh, I have that cloud teller, which is like a fortune teller that tells you about the different types of clouds. I still have that leftover from when I was going to do it as a grab and go. I'm going to do this cloud in the jar and link it with that and make a whole in-person program with it. So uh, those are linked there. NASA is also a great resource. They have a lot of amazing stuff that you could do there for free. So definitely check out their website too. Um, and then really quick, I wanted to share this resource with you guys. I've just started this. This is from IEEE Science Kits for Public Libraries. And this was something that magically came to me. It was in library talk. So maybe you saw the email that came through for this. And then I didn't see it, but my coworker saw it and knew I was into STEM. So she forwarded it on to me. It is a grant that you can apply for and they give you money to make circulating STEM kits in your library. So if you don't have money, apply for this. Um, when I, I got it last year, it's $2,000 that I'm getting this year to build them. I don't know if that will change, but that's what it was when I got it. Um, the only thing is you have to build the kits yourself. They don't have the kits already pre-made. And so you have to use the money and purchase whatever you want to make your own kits, which could be good or bad if you don't have a lot of time to do that. Um, but uh, it's for the libraries that are listed there. So Iowa is one of them. And if we have people watching from other states, there's other ones in the Midwest listed there too that can apply. And um, I am just in the beginning of this. So I can't really speak to a ton of stuff about it other than the fact that, um, as you know, we can bridge a gap for kiddos who cannot get these um, STEM programs. Maybe they're not doing that at their school and that sort of thing. Maybe the school doesn't have funding to do a lot of STEM programming in that. So we can be that bridge. And I think that these science kits can really help with that. So I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. Um, Okay, so uh, I am at the end of my presentation. I just wanted to share with you guys my contact information there. Um, that is my uh, email address. If you have any questions or if you want me to share any documents that I did for any of my programs, I am more than happy to do that. That's one of the things that I love about this profession. I was just talking to my husband about this. The library profession is the best because we're not competitive. We just share mm -hmm. everything we're doing. If we have a great program, we're like, hey, everybody, come do this because it's working for me. And I, maybe it'll work for you. I love that about libraries. And so I'm all in on sharing anything with you guys. Um, I also have my social media handles there. So if you want to come find me on social media and say hi, I would love to um, you know, connect with you that way. And then on the very bottom there, I have a blog that I'm starting because I love sharing my information. So I don't have a lot of information on that yet, but I am working on it. So keep um, checking on that. And I hope to share all my STEM stuff that I do so I can make it easier for other libraries to incorporate those programs with them as well. So if anyone, if there's any questions, I would be happy to answer those. Well, Katie, this was just great information and, and for kids of all ages. I mean, this some of this stuff could be adult STEM, STEAM programming, right? Yes. Yeah, I um, think so. Yeah. I would love to do some of this, especially like right. rebuilding. The or, uh, fairy or tale engineering one was yeah. really fun that way. Or intergenerational even, you know, yes. family, family type programming. I think that would be just a blast. Yes. I noticed a question go past though that asked about your uh, fairy tale engineering, which I love the idea of that and asked what your typical age group is for that. Okay, that's a really great question. I think I usually skew a little higher in ages for that program. So I think that is, okay, our youth department goes up to sixth grade. So I think I usually am more like third, fourth, and sixth grade, maybe second, but probably not much lower than that. Although you certainly could, I mean, kiddos of all ages would have fun building. Um, it's just a little tricky when they're actually having to 
um, do more than just like stacking blocks when they actually have to like put things together with tape or glue and that sort of thing that gets a little trickier. So I think um, I can't really remember what I had put in my actual program, but I think it's more like a three, four, five, six grade. Okay. And also, I would love to use hot glue. I think hot glue would be perfect for that program, but I'm too scared. So <laughs> if you think you could use hot glue with kiddos, that would probably be like the best thing to use. But duct tape or um, like electrical tape, masking tape is kind of more my go-to. Ah. And what about um, programming uh, connections to the summer reading program theme? Yeah. Um, so this upcoming year, it's like um, outdoorsy, um, right? It's outdoorsy. Yeah. Okay. And so, I'm stumped to right now. I'm drawing a blank on what the theme is. Read I beyond the read. beyond the something beyond the beyond your borders or something beyond or? something beyond the beaten know. path. Yes, beyond that's the it. beaten yes. path. It came to me. Yes. Yes. There we go. Okay. So. Um, what I wanted to share with you guys, but I didn't have time to share with you guys, it probably would work really well for this summer theme, is if any of you guys have story walks set up, depending on where you have your story walk, we have one and it's in a park, it's along a nature trail, and I have done a stunt program with that, um, where we did a uh, nature hunt, uh, we had like a scavenger hunt that we had made, and um, we, so what we did is we walked on the trail and I would read the pages as we came up to it. So we read the story as we went. In addition to that, I gave them like a scavenger hunt sheet where they could look for certain things on the path as we went. Um, and a little hint that I learned from a webinar I took um, about having, I can't remember the name of the people who do this, Nature Made or something like that. Anyway, they do preschools outside year round, no classrooms. Um, but um, I went to their programs because out of STEM stuff, I don't really have a lot of love for anything, but nature is like my one thing that I do like. Anyway, um, they said that you sh if you can't bring your class outside, try to bring elements into your classroom that are nature. And so rather than using like clip um, art pictures, they said use real pictures. And rather than using things that are um, not in your area, which is good in some cases to teach them about like animals that are other places, but use things that are local to your community. And so we made a scavenger hunt and I worked with my marketing person to do this and she had done like clip art and I was like, can we actually use real pictures? And um, so I had gotten some real pictures um, on the trail from my coworker who worked with me on this program. He went out, he was, he's kind of our nature expert. And he also walked the trail with us and he pointed out cool things to the kids and parents as we walked on the trail. So it was like three parts of this program, but you could not do that if you don't have a nature expert and just do the scavenger hunt um, as you're walking, but use real pictures and then also use uh, things and you could find real pictures online. You don't have to go take them yourself, I'm sure, but also try to use animals that are local. Like my marketing person put it like a parrot on there for the bird we don't have parrots here out in nature and so I said can we switch out that bird for a different bird um and so that's really important that I think would be a really fun one uh for the kiddos um to do and also the story time stem packs that I had talked about they have one that is with a Kate Mesner book over and under the pond and um so that would be a really good one to bring some outside uh, programming into your library. Um, additionally, let me see, can I go back really quick? I had another program that I had done and you could probably do this pretty cheaply. Sorry if I'm giving you guys like um, dizziness from doing that. Okay, in the picture on the left, can you guys see my mouse? Bonnie, I just want to mention that we're running out of time here. We're actually at 3.30. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. All right. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah, I would say like a nature scavenger hunt would be an easy way to do something outside. All right. Questions well, I, well, I think we've, um, I think we're out of time, but I'm glad that you've given us your email on the closing slide, the slides will be available on the ILOC conference page along yes. with the recordings. Yes. Um, so thank you, Katie. Thanks a million for 
this look at full steam ahead programming uh, at your library. And I hope others will be able to say yes to steam programming in their libraries. So we so appreciate the time you've spent prepping the, the presentation for today and actually sharing it with all of us. Uh, much appreciated. Yeah, thank you, everyone.